Acts chapter 9. And Saul, yet breathing out threatening, threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did he eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered him, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in, thy, in the way that thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain, then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, He is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is this not he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews, and after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying a wait was known of Saul, and he watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him, which, when the brethren knew that they had brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. And it came to pass, as Peter passed through all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydia. And there he found a certain man named Enos, which, he had, kept, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Enos, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole, arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelt at Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and almsdeeds, which she did. 
And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom, when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And forasmuch as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the windows stood, and all the widows stood by him weeping, and showing and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth, and kneeled down and prayed, and turning then to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her her hand, and lift her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he carried, tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. So we'll start at the end of the chapter with a fun fact, because Luke does that. At the end of chapters and the end of sections, he just kind of throws this out. So next week, chapter 10, we're going to see Peter and Cornelius and Peter's dream about unclean foods and so forth. Another great story in the book of Acts. Which is interesting about Peter dreaming about things that are unclean when this last verse of chapter 9 said, and he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon a tanner. Guess what a tanner is? It's like a butcher. Isn't it? Well, it's someone who hides hide, so guess what he is? He's ritually unclean because he works with dead bodies. So oh. he's unclean and Peter stayed with him. So Peter didn't have a problem with staying with that guy even though he's unclean, but unclean foods, oh, he can't touch those. So you have this contradiction going on where he's going to have this dream and find out, oh, everything that was formerly unclean is now clean. That's next week. I just like how Luke drops this little tidbit at the end of the section. That people will get. Yeah, it's like, oh, he stayed with a tanner. Why? They're unclean. But this chapter is all about Paul, right? So Paul is still crying bloody murder. He's trying to get Christians killed. This is bad. So a little background about Saul. You know, Saul is not just some punk. Right, you remember we've talked about you know the Pharisees, and then the Pharisees, you have your Sanhedrin, which is your ruling council. When you have enough people in a town, you have so many people, you're big enough to have a Sanhedrin, a ruling council, so they elect these guys. And then among those guys, you have your, what would be like your seminary professors, right? Your doctors of the law, right? Just like we have doctors of theology, you would have these doctors of the law, meaning the law of Moses, doctors of scripture. So these doctors of scripture, those are the scribes. Scribes didn't always mean guys that make copies of stuff. It originally meant the guys who were the, as Paul called himself, a Pharisee of Pharisees. They were the learned, really, really knew intimately the word of God. Paul's one of them. Paul's been sent to the best. I can get you guys the background where all this comes from. Paul went to the best lost Pharisee schools, right? The best Torah schools. He's been groomed to be an uppity up Pharisee, to be a scribe, to be a doctor of theology. So he is like head Jew in training. He, he's like big time up in the hierarchy. He's being groomed for this position and he does not like Christians, right? He's getting these letters so that he can, you can put them in bondage and drag them back to Jerusalem for trial. Anyone belonging to the way, and I think this is the first or second time in Acts, it's been called the way, followers of Christ. I think this is the second time. So early Christians called themselves followers of the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? And I think I mentioned it before in that early Christian writing called the Didache, the teaching of the 12 apostles. Uh, the way it starts out is there are two ways, one of life and one of death. And one of life is the one they follow, the way. So early Christians call themselves followers of the way. Saul doesn't want anything to do with these guys. He wants them wiped out. So he's on his way to Damascus. He got letters for the synagogues in Damascus so he could go in, find these guys, and drag them back to Jerusalem in chains. And on his way, uh, he's struck down, right? Light from heaven flashed, ESV says. 
God uses nature that way. Right? So we don't always see a flash from heaven now, but he did that. He did that with burning bushes. He did that with uh, thunder and lightning and fire and cloud on top of Mount Sinai. Uh, which, since those are theophanies, those are manifestations of God in the physical world, which means we usually associate with the second person of the Trinity, it makes sense that Jesus does this now, right? Suddenly there's a bright light and a voice, and it's me, it's Jesus. Why are you persecuting me? Um, there's a good Luther quote in this Lutheran study Bible. When the word of God strikes the heart, it's like a thunderbolt, which overthrows even the most strongly fortified places by its force. Paul hated the gospel with such an obstinate heart that he was like an immovable rock, yet he is shattered by the hammer of the word. For God kills and brings to life, he brings down to Shoal when he raises up. That is from, let's see, it's American Edition, Volume 3, so that's his early lectures on Genesis, is where that comes from, even though he's quoting Samuel. And Luther had his, uh, not conversion experience, but his change of heart experience, right, with thunder, as the story goes, that he was, you know, running through a thunderstorm and lightning hit a tree nearby or hit something nearby in the bright flash and the lightning. He feared for his life. He thought he was going to die. And he prayed to St. Anne, which would be the Virgin Mary's mother. Uh, St. Anne, if you save me, I will become a monk. And and he became a monk because he survived. So he went, became a monk, and the rest is, as they say, history. Uh, so you have these great cosmic events that kind of mark out these historic events. And this is definitely a historic event. You know, this is, this is God taking this really bad guy and using him in a complete 180 to be the greatest evangelizer and missionary the world has ever seen, right? There's never been anybody like Paul since. Nobody. I don't care who we mention. I mean, he went to places that nobody had ever gone. All over the place. Uh, so it just shows you how big of a turnaround a human life can take. <coughs> And normally people would have probably thought, oh, you know, like a Jew like Saul, he was irredeemable. Look how horrible he was. God didn't think so. He redeemed him. Uh, he wants everybody to be redeemed. Um, it's up to us whether we will reject it. It's not up to us to accept it, but it is, up, it is in our power to reject it. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus, who you're persecuting. But forget about that. Get up and do this. It's like, it's Jesus, but that's not important right now. This is what you got to do, right? <laughs> it's almost what it sounds like. You know, go here, and then you'll hear what to do next. Right? None of these other people saw it. They heard it, but they didn't see it. And it was the last thing Paul saw, because then he's Blind, then he doesn't see anything. So they took him to Damascus, and for three days he was without sight, neither ate nor drank. Um, is the three days significant? Is it symbolic? Probably. Um, it, does it actually mean anything in this story? No. Uh, is it symbolic? Three days is always symbolic of, of uh, Christ's death and resurrection, always, every time you see the three days. In the Old Testament, how long did it take for Isaac and Abraham to get up the mountain? Yeah, so then it's directly symbolic of that, the three-day journey. Uh, so, yeah, I would say the three days is symbolically important here. So he is blinded, and then his salvation took three days. Jesus told him, go here do this, it took three days, and then he could see and he was baptized. So in a way, his salvation in quotes, quote unquote salvation, took three days. Um, I think that is symbolic for us to think about that, um, the three days in the tomb. 
again. Rise and go to the street called Straight. Where's that at? Straight Street. Just the main street. Anybody have a note about the significance of the name of that street? It's probably follow the same route of a long street street that today runs through the city from east to west. Okay. There's a, there's a decided contrast to the numerous crooked streets of the city. Okay, so <clears throat> Main Street, that's what we call Main Street today, but I guess straight compared to crooked, so Paul was on a crooked path, now he's going to be on the straight and narrow. I, is that over-reading it? Maybe, maybe not, but that is Freddie. Speaking of Freddie, Freddie is talking about it. Um, yeah. You know, and, and then he goes and tells him, this is what you got to do. Go to this place, find this guy. And uh, now he goes, the Lord comes to Ananias in a vision and says, oh, hey, okay, this is what you got to do. This is where you got to go. You're going to find this guy. He's going to be praying. He's going to be praying about you coming and doing this. And this is this is what you got to do. And Ananias goes, um, are you sure? Crazy. He's like, um, Really? Because I've heard about this guy. And if you ever notice, the prophets did that too in the Old Testament. I mean, sure it's like the prophets are like, yeah, um, okay, I'm hearing what you're saying, but really? Are you sure? I don't want to do that. Or really? Are you sure? I want to go that way instead. In fact, I'm going to go that way instead. Jonah. Jonah, right. And God says, oh, no, you're not. No, you are not. You know, and what makes Jonah, that would be a good Bible study too, because it's a short book, so I can't ramble on for 20 weeks. But, you know, Jonah, it was after all of that with Jonah, he gets off, he gets spat out of the fish, he goes and does his job, and it's like over. Like that instantly works. The whole city goes, yeah, okay. <laughs> and they repent and everything's good. It's like all you had to do. Look how easy that was. Yeah. But no. It didn't, it didn't last, though. No, it didn't. And that's, that's what he was upset about. He figured that would happen. Yeah, but that's not the point. I mean, that would be the point of the Bible study. And, and that's the same thing here with Ananias, right? It's like, well, you really, do you know who this guy is? It's like, yeah, but I have a plan, God says. Do you have a plan? I have a plan. So Go do what you're told, right? Basically. Okay. And he's going to go do this with Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. And he's going to suffer for it, too. So Ananias says, fine. And he goes and does it. And he says, Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, by which you came, has sent me so that you can regain your sight and be filled from the Holy, with the Holy Spirit. Um, something like scales fell from his eyes. Didn't that happen when Jesus healed somebody? Mm -hmm. Which one was that? I thought so. It happened one of the times Jesus healed the blind. So you have that same, and it's the little details, and it's got to be, I'll guarantee it's in Luke. I'll guarantee it's in Luke. I'm not going to, I'm going to go out on a limb, I'm not going to look it up right now, but I'll guarantee that detail is in Luke's gospel because of the way Luke is paralleling an event in the life of the apostles with events in the life of Christ, paralleling these guys, paralleling the life of Jesus with the life of the apostles as the early church starts. The book of Acts and the gospel of Luke do that. They track completely through. Maybe I'm nuts, but I, I'm willing to bet. I'm willing to bet a Sunday morning Lutheran cup of coffee that that, that is in Luke. Which, if you're listening on the internet, that means a not very good cup of coffee. So, not much of a loss if you lose, and it's definitely not a win if you win. Okay, so he gets his sight back, he gets baptized, he gets fed because Ananias is a good Lutheran, and there's a potluck immediately after the baptism. And he immediately, Saul gets up and starts preaching the gospel. 
immediately. So, quite the conversion. And everybody sees it too, right? For a long chapter, this is going really fast, but it's all narrative. Uh, so everybody knew who this was, and now he's done this complete 180. And like, oh, wait, isn't he here to arrest us? Because that's who this guy is. He was the one who was going to come here to arrest us, and now he's preaching about Jesus. And Saul just get a, got, was getting better and better, all the more gaining strength, confounding all the Jews, uh, proving that Jesus was the Christ. So good student that he was can probably pull all those prophecies that Jesus fulfilled right out of the law and the prophets, all the 380 whatever it is prophecies Jesus fulfilled, all the messianic prophecies, which he probably had photographic knowledge of as that rabbinical student, you know, top-notch rabbinical student that he was. Coupled with divine revelation from Jesus himself that, yes, I really am the Messiah, and yes, I'm the one you're persecuting, and now you're going to go preach that to the world. So couple that with that incredible knowledge of the scripture, keeping in mind this other stuff hasn't been written yet, and it's not really circulating yet. Maybe epistles of Paul's, but he hasn't written them yet because he just got converted. He's the, that's the first part of the New Testament to be written, were some of Paul's epistles. So nothing is written down yet. So the scriptures are still just the Jewish scriptures, which Paul has encyclopedic knowledge of. So he could take all that, and he's using that to prove Jesus was the Christ, is the Christ, right? Like no one else. I mean, Peter's doing it. The other apostles are doing it. Do you think anyone ever asked him why did this sudden change? Yeah, I imagine they had to. I mean, you look at what it says. Hasn't he come here for this purpose? Is this not the man? It's like they heard him, they're amazed, and they said, Has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? And you know that word, that verb, amazed where it's used in scripture, usually it's also, look in Luke's gospel, right? And the people, uh, they use, Mark uses astonished a lot. Anytime they use amazed, astonished, it's at Jesus' preaching. They were astonished as one who was speaking with authority, they said. Like, he doesn't preach like these guys in the synagogue. He's like, he's preaching like he actually has the authority to say what he's talking about. So amazed and astonished usually means that's that's preaching with some power, right? Like, and wait a minute, wasn't he gonna come to arrest these guys? And now what is he doing? So yeah, they're confused, right? And his arguments have to be the best because he knows scripture inside and out. He knows absolutely. I would liken it to I would liken it to those two disciples on the road to Emmaus when Jesus appeared to them on Easter morning. And as they were walking, he was explained the scripture to them, and he, oh, scripture was open to them. They understood everything in the Law of the Prophets and the Psalms, basically the entire scriptures. They understood it perfectly. I would say what happened, what Saul is doing is equivalent to that. He has that level of understanding. Um, not necessarily that Jesus spoke to him and gave him that divine revelation of the meaning of Scripture, but he had it there all the time. And it just needed that one thing to unlock, yeah, Jesus really is that Messiah. He, he's been here. He's gone, but he's come. And he has that knowledge, and now he was like, oh, that's the piece I've been missing. Kind of big piece. But um, that had to be an incredible preaching ability from the get-go, being able to do that. Again, that's my thoughts, reading the narrative. He's like, well, it makes sense. Knowing Saul's background, it makes sense he would be able to do that. Once he understood Jesus was the Christ, then Scripture would have been like an open book to him and go, well, here you go, All right? It was no longer a mystery to him, and now he's teaching people, hey, it's no mystery to you either, convincing them, proving to them that Jesus was the Christ. So what happens to you when that happens? Then all of a sudden the Jews want to kill him, right? Not this. It's like, well, 
that plan didn't work. Nope. Right, so the Jews are confounded. Uh, they want to kill him. Uh, not only that, he is cut off. Right? So not only do they want to kill him, I mean, it's, his old life is gone. That's suffered. All those aspirations to greatness. Now I'm adding to the biblical narrative here by what I know of Saul's background. But you think about a young guy who's been groomed for the top. You know, he's the, the rising star on the Jewish religious scene. All of a sudden, that would be like, I mean, that would be like, that would be like a Pope getting up tomorrow and announcing that he's converted to Islam. All right, and you'd just be like, well, I mean, maybe not this Pope, because we just go, yeah, what did he say? Did he really mean to say that? Okay, so maybe not this Pope. But it'd be, it'd be, it'd be like a, it'd be, it'd be like a cardinal from, like Timothy Cardinal Dolan from New York, possibly going to be a Pope someday. It's being groomed for that, right? You know, maybe 10, 20 years from now. That would be like him getting up tomorrow, and then the headline in the New York Times is Cardinal Tim, Timothy Cardinal Dolan converts to Islam. Right? You just be, what? <laughs> Like, how quickly would Rome cut him off, right? Same thing here. Look at this rising star in Judaism. All of a sudden, disappears for three days and comes back and goes, yeah, I'm a follower of the way now. Yeah, all those people I was persecuting, yeah, I'm one of them. They, they couldn't separate them, distance themselves from him quick enough. So, yeah, they want to kill him. And his whole old life is gone. No connections in the synagogue, not welcome anywhere. So like the, the hurt that Jesus is talking about, you're going to suffer for his name would begin immediately, wouldn't it? It's not like, oh yeah, Paul's going to suffer these shipwrecks and, you know, and they're going to put him in jail. That had to start on day one for him. Don't you think? Yeah, no money. Like, you know, you gotta be, uh, you're going to be out there begging for food. His family would have turned on him. Oh, his family probably could not have backpedaled quick enough away from him, right? Maybe, because, you know, we even saw that in Jesus' time. You saw people on the council, even. You know, just kind of in the background. It's like, eh, eh, eh. But uh, 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 Joseph of Arimathea, you know, he's not a nobody. You know, he was in in that circle. He traveled in those circles. So yeah, maybe he took some with him. Maybe they had to do it clandestinely. I mean, you look at... Who am I thinking of? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. And actually, the new Jesus TV series did it really nice. Chosen? Mm-hmm. Where it's like, oh yeah, like Nicodemus is that close. And all he does is he leaves the money where they'll find it because he can't let go. Of, and they portrayed it really good in the show. It's like he can't let go of the clothes and the perfumes and the respect and the honor and all that stuff. And, oh, what am I going to do to my wife because she's used to the standard of living? You could just see all of that coming to that head and go, I can't walk away from this. I, I want to, but I don't have strong enough faith. I don't have the faith to walk away from that. And it's the same as you saw in parables. You know, with the uh, the parable of the rich young man, he could not turn away. He, Jesus said, okay, the one thing you need to do is give away everything you have to the poor and follow me. And legend has it, that's Mark that wrote Mark's gospel, uh, which that story is in Mark's gospel, that eventually he did turn. Uh, but that's just a tradition that has no basis in scripture. Uh, but you see that again and again and again. So this this conversion here, I mean, we don't give it much thought, I don't think. You just go, okay, Paul had this conversion experience and they let him down in the basket. That's the story we remember from Sunday school. And he just, he starts preaching and he becomes this great missionary and then like shipwrecked it by snake. All this other bad stuff happens to him. And that's what Jesus was talking about. No! It started right now. The day he starts preaching, everything changes for him. And he never looks back. 
I just think that's interesting and something that, that needs more thought. One of those things that when it's only in a couple verses in our Bibles, we don't unpack what that actually says uh, necessarily in these narratives because there's a lot of substance to it. It would be something they wouldn't even give a thought in a, in a story if they made a movie of this uh, where you could probably do a cut scene for like two minutes and show some of these things and show his life changing that would convey more than the thousand words I just babbled for 10 minutes uh, would ever do. Uh, it's one time where media uh, is maybe a better, video is a better medium than the written word sometimes. Uh, it can convey impressions and thoughts that we understand better than trying to verbal it, verbalize it. Yeah, feelings. Exactly. Uh, so you get that in those just couple verses, that how much his life changed. Like what Jesus said would come to pass came to pass immediately, I think. We're, thought, we're thinking about, worth sharing with people if you ever talk about Paul, about, you know, what was that like? Uh, well, he had a real hard time. Oh, yeah, because, I mean, it's going to get worse, but... Because people knew him as the bad guy. Mm -hmm. So when he went to, to visit the Christians and... And they're all like, <laughs> yeah, it was, it would be, you remember that commercial a long time ago where they had the Dawn dishwashing li liquid, they, mm -hmm. they had, they drop one drop in and every, and the grease went like this, yeah. and that's how everybody, oh, yes, well, they would call him Saul, and they would just scatter. Yeah, yeah, exactly, that's yeah. a real good, or, good, good <laughs> illustration. It's like, they just get to flee. It's mm -hmm. like, it's like, oh, that's Strike toxic. The shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then people, I think, like to point to Paul's conversion experience because they like to talk about, and you can't see this in an audio recording by making finger quotes, conversion experience, because in American evangelicalism, the conversion experience is a big deal because your conversion experience is something you have control over, it seems to be, where you make a decision to dedicate your life to Jesus. Um, and not that our choices don't come into play. They do come into play. We do make conscious decisions. It's the Holy Spirit's urging doing it. It's not you. Um, so not to knock total wind out of your sails, but it's the Holy Spirit does it to you. Just like the Holy Spirit just did this to Saul. You know, Saul didn't decide to become a Christian. God chose him. And the evidence was overwhelming to his senses you can't argue with. Uh, Saul was not going to say no to such evidence, right? Because that's the only choice you have is to sit, reject God. Uh, but we don't have that kind of experience. You know, we don't see light. Jesus does not manifest and talk to us. Um, if he does, you may need help because uh, it's not usually how he operates in this day and age. I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm just saying I would highly doubt it. Uh, th because this is not the apostolic area. That is when, when miracles of that sort still occurred. But that is a unique experience, and people reading the Bible and then wanting to say, I want something like that because then I'll know. Um, no, then you're going to be disappointed. That's not going to happen. I mean, is there going to be some strange impulse one day that makes you walk into a church? Yes. That was your experiences like something made you go to church that day maybe a lot of events in your past and you finally said why am i putting this off i'm just going to go to church this sunday and then you never stop going well that was your conversion experience it's equally miraculous that's the power of the holy spirit at work not as dramatic but it's the same way because you explained it then you just decided to walk into a church one day did you really decide did you really decide enough about that Okay, so the Jews are plotting against him immediately because this is bad because now there's more. And hey, this one is really loud because this one's really loud because he knows his stuff. He knows his scripture and he really knows how to persuasively argue that Jesus is the Christ because it's unassailable when you can explain the scriptures to someone. But Saul probably still heard things because the plot became known to him. And since they're watching the gates day and night, 
they let him down through a hole in the wall in a basket. And then he made his way back to Jerusalem. Do you think that was a normal decision? Going from Damascus to Jerusalem? Was that the place to go? Well, it says here in the footnotes, it says that after many days, in the footnotes here, after many days, it said three years. Okay. That's so a maybe, lot of days. Maybe three comes into play again. Maybe. Maybe. Really? Three years? Where did they get that from? I don't know. It just it says after many days, three years. Let's see. When many days have passed. It says that okay. a major part of this period was spent on Arabia. But you know, I have heard I've heard that three years before, and the reason I've heard that three years before is it came up is like, well, that that is where Saul got his training from, which I don't put any stock in because he has all his training already. This guy's this guy's top notch rabbinical student at this point. Um, but I think someone is trying to draw one of those parallels, like I said, because Luke's gospel and the book of Acts parallel each other so well, uh, deliberately, that's the way Luke constructed them. Um, not that he added or subtra maybe subtracted things, but he maybe reordered things for rhetorical effect of these two books, um, which was a perfectly reasonable thing they did in those days. Uh, but that three years parallel, uh, trying to parallel it to another three year period, which I just forgot what I was going to say. I hate when I do that. John the Baptist. Because uh, there was tradition, John the Baptist spent three years in the wilderness. Is it tradition or is it in the Bible? I got a look now, being John. Somewhere I'm getting that John the Baptist spent three years in the wilderness, getting his training, so to speak. Uh, where I got that from? His ministry, three or four, depending on what calendar you use. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I don't know. That might be tradition, too. But, yeah, that, that three-year period, that comes into play uh, in a lot of traditions. So. so, scratch what I just said. I made that out of thin air, apparently. Uh but yeah. So Jerusalem, maybe not the best choice if you're trying to keep a low profile. Just saying, they're all out to kill you. Don't go right into the lion's den, maybe. But who else did that? I, I kind of set myself up for that one. Okay. So, yes, Sorry. Daniel did. Lots of good stories in Daniel. We should do Daniel. We should yeah, do Daniel. Oh, Daniel's good. oh, and then we could do all the parts of Daniel that got cut out of Daniel that are in the Apocrypha. Because there's good stories in that stuff, too. A lot, of, a lot of the weird stories in the Apocrypha are parts of Daniel that got taken out. Uh, because they are non-inspired or non-scriptural. Anyway, uh, yeah, so who else went to Jerusalem? When he made Jesus. it, Jesus did exactly. So there's your parallel, All right? Jesus set his eyes on Jerusalem. He knew he had to go there, and so he did. He didn't avoid it. He met it head on, and he went. He not only went, he wept over it. Okay, so he went to Jerusalem, and he tried to join the disciples, but what happened? I wonder why. But then Barnabas spoke up for him. Where? Right. So Barnabas spoke up for him. Why did Barnabas speak up for him? Well, didn't he witness the conversion? Was he one of the ones? Well, he said he did. How on the road he had seen him. Well, in verse 27, he says, Yep. So Barnabas took him. How he had seen the Lord on the road. Mm -hmm. So he said he saw it. 
And they said, okay. And not only that, so they saw what happened, and they also saw what happened after. So, prayer's like, hey, no, he's changed. Right? That's going to be yeah, hard. Think about that. I mean, if you, if you were there, and you were involved in that situation, would you not be hesitant? Mm-hmm. I know I would be. I mean, yeah, she was like, oh, no, no, I'm one of you now. Oh, okay, come on in. And it's like, now that I would understand taking three years. More than it's like, really? It's like, I, mm, yeah. You know, that would have been a hard sell. It's like, okay, yeah, no, I see that. It's like, I'm sure he had to make his case. I mean, again, I'm adding to the narrative here. It's not here, but it's like, really? You think that was easy? If you think of how brutal he was, I mean, he's the guy holding people's coats when they right. killed the first martyr. Yeah. 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 So. And then too, with his with his friends, or if he was part of the scribe group, mm -hmm. so to speak, wouldn't you think that they would have a hard time going? I don't believe this. And it's like really, and wait. Yeah. So is he a double agent? I was like, I don't know if they had double agents in those days. I had double agents in those days. So like, how did they know it wasn't a whole setup? It's like he's trying to get in. Because he's going to get them from inside. Again, I'm adding to the narrative here. But real, how could that thought not cross their minds? That's right. There's different I mean, this is highly suspicious. Yeah. yeah. All right? On both sides. Yeah. So, yeah, that was probably not the, I mean, that's probably the pithiest understatement that we saw here. And when he came to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. Okay, that is the that is the best construction way to put that. All right. But then he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching. They heard what he was saying. And I've, if he's going in and out among them, that phrase, going in and out among them, he's one of them. That means he's going in and out. He's, he's welcome. He's yeah. accepted. He is breaking bread with them. Right, so he's worshiping with them, uh, and then he is speaking against the Hellenists, who we've seen before. Right, so you get the Hellenists; those are the the uh, Greek, Greek Jews, yeah. or the Greek-speaking Jews. So he was speaking and disputing, so arguing with them. That's what a disputation is. So that he's he's preaching. He's speaking against them, and he's disputing against them, and they're seeking to kill them. Right? Familiar, of course. All right, so, yep. They're trying to kill him. So when the brothers heard this, then they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him back to Tarsus. Right? Or sent him home. He's from Tarsus. So down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. All right, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, somebody have a map to see how big an area that is, had peace and was built, being built up. Walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Why do I say that when I carry around with the maps? Just in case I need to yell out. They clean them up first. Yes. Sometimes they send those baby pictures too soon. He's actually quite cute. So that makes you. Is that great, grandchild? Yeah. Wow. I'm yep. a little greater grandfather. You are a little greater grandfather. <laughs> so all right, so we're talking about Well that's a pretty big area. Yeah, so we're talking Judea and Galilee and Samaria. So here, here is, and I'll, I'll throw the overlay over, which is the modern boundaries if you want to look at it. So here is Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. 
So I'll give you an idea. This is Syria. This is Egypt. This is basically Israel today, right? So you look here, and here's the state of Israel. That's pretty much the entire state of Israel today. So Galilee, Samaria, and Judea. Now you can pass that around if you want. Don't want it close. All right, so here's another one of those little verses that we just throw out when we read this narrative. It's like, okay, so they, they heard he was going to get killed. They shipped him out back to Tarsus. And, oh, by the way, the church throughout all of Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. And they just throw that off. Look at a map. That's a pretty big area. That's a huge area, right? And it says... The church, meaning the Christians, throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, a huge area, had peace and was growing and walking in the fear of the Lord, meaning they're still of one mind, right? They, they haven't split off into different denominations of the way yet, right? And in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and the church is growing. So how much influence did Paul have in his persecution of the church and running around, right? Again, we're adding to the narrative here. I'm, I'm just trying to get us to think about the setting and think about these little statements we have in Scripture and apply it to the geopolitical reality of the area back then. And it's, it just tosses it off like, okay, so Paul is no longer persecuting the church, so all these things happened, and then it says, so the church throughout this huge region now has peace and prosperity, and they're growing. How much did Paul's persecutions and those involved with him pervade the church then? That all of a sudden this entire region has peace. And how many of the like little Paul, little Sauls that were running around going, I want to be like Saul. I want to be as good a persecutor as Saul is. And saw what happened to him when <laughs> did they become Christians? Or did they just, I'm out, I'm not doing this anymore. Look what happened. That's huge. So I, I just think it's an interesting little one sentence statement we have in scripture that you know Paul was doing this and now he's not. And look how great everything is. Look at how big an area has peace. That's crazy that an area that large. Yeah, God had a plan. God has a plan. And Paul isn't even Paul yet. You know, Saul isn't Paul yet. He's not doing his thing yet. He's just going to be getting started. It's okay, so now we're done with Saul, Saul's conversion. And now we have this healing of Aeneas. What was that in King James? Because it seemed like I was reading a really weird name. And I never put my yeah, bookmark sure. back. I never. Chapter 9. Probably just the type 1. 32. Because that AE looks weird together. And, well, the, the E's oh, are no. long. Those are long E's. Right. And then the S's. 34. And then, of course, all the S's, S's. are literal long S's. It's really oh. hard to read this font. They're very small. Uh, chapter 9, a verse 32. If, that's, if the first letter is a long A, it would be A-E-N-E-S. 32. Uh, it came to pass as Peter passed through all quarters. He came down also to the same switch as at Libya. And there you put the Enos. So you're not pronouncing the A on there then? Who is it? Aeneas? Aeneas. Be Aeneas. Does the pronunciation... Can you use Enos or Aeneas? Well, the pronunciation in mine says capital A, <coughs> and then there's a small E with a line over it, which would make it an E sound. Yeah, see, the old, old King James, it's just me. Okay. 
And this one has A E. A E N E A S. And both E's have the, the it's the long E and the second set, the N E has the accent on it. Okay. So it'll be in A's. Anyway, so where were we? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, Peter went down there, came to all the saints of the Delidia. He found a man named uh, Anna, Aeneas, who was paralyzed and bedridden for eight years. And Peter heals him. And immediately he rose, and everybody there at Lydda and Sharon, I don't know how far Lydda is from Sharon, Probably in that one. Uh, Do you want this? Yeah, sure. Little Chuck it across. It's oh, It's made for that. So let's see. I don't see Sharon on this map, but Lida is southeast of Joppa. Mm -hmm. It's about 12 miles from Joppa. What map are you looking at? That's a long walk. Color map four for them. Yeah, I'm not looking at that. It's like where navigation went. Oh, it's way over there. Okay. Otherwise, yeah, I don't have where Sharon is. That's all right. Not that it matters where Sharon is. Yeah, Sharon couldn't have been that big because it would be on one of these maps if it was bigger. I would think. So what does he think the significance is of just having this, what is that, four verses, three verses? This miracle that Peter performs. And it's just kind of tucked in there. See that? It's just tucked in there. So we hear the story of Saul, and then we're going to hear about a big miracle. But then this little one just kind of... Well, it's just an example of the apostolic time and, and the, the signs that were created that were necessary to grow the church at that time. Mm -hmm. And all of the residents of these two towns saw this guy who was paralyzed be healed and then they Turned. became Christians. All of them. That's impressive. So the church is growing and growing and growing. We hear all this great, I love the church growth, guys. Gotta love this book. Because we're not growing because you're not doing this, right? So you have all this magnificent growth happening in the church. And now, now we're in Joppa, so we go west, right? Joppa. And there's Tabitha, or Dorcas, which I guess means gazelle. Um... She was full of good works and acts of charity. She was a stand-up girl, right? She did good work. She was a good person, did good things. She got ill. She died. They prepared her for burial, right? Watched her. And since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent for him to come there. <coughs> what does that sound like? Jesus mm -hmm, exactly. Right? So a parallel here with, with Jesus' healing of Jairus' daughter. Uh, so Peter comes. <coughs> Please give this up. I gave both my cough drops. All right. Uh, so Peter went and rose, and they arrived. They took him to the upper room. And all the widows were staring there, showing up. That, Look at what the stuff she used to make for us. You know, she was this great... Great lady, they're all crying. Um, Peter sent them all out. 
who did Jesus do that to? Remember, is that the same story or is that a different story? Different miracle. When Jesus sent everybody else out of the room. I think he did that. Probably. So, the well, centurion's daughter, didn't he send everybody out? Because they were all there wailing and then he said that they were just merely asleep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so again, you have this parallel between one of the miracles of the apostles paralleling a miracle that Christ performed. Uh, on purpose. You know, on purpose, you know, again, it's like not only could the apostles do these things, they did the exact things Jesus did. It's like, oh, did you see what Peter just did? Remember when Jesus did that? Oh, yeah, okay, great. So Peter does the same thing, knelt down, prayed, and then turned and said, Tabitha, arise, and she got up. And then he called everybody back and says, hey, look, she's alive. And then everybody there believes because of the miracle they saw. And then we have the one-off that we started with about him staying with Simon Tanner. Maybe he's friends because they're both named Simon. I don't know. It's like, oh, Simon being a Tanner would be unclean, so he shouldn't have been able to stay with him. Stay with him. How many people stopped what they were doing and followed Jesus when he rose, brought somebody back from the dead? Yeah. I'm sure there's some, but I mean, with enough to mention, or they would have mentioned it, right? I mean, sometimes, sometimes the person Jesus healed followed them, like the the one out of ten lepers became a disciple. Sometimes people followed him, but most of the time, they continue. They, they, they just. Okay, they stayed and they may have told people about what Jesus did for them, but they didn't necessarily. Sometimes the people he healed can, became Christians, but it doesn't say, oh, they saw what Jesus did and they all became believers. No, they didn't. In this way, there were just many believers instead of all. Mm -hmm. Which, but right, still, Gapo's a bigger city. Gapo's a huge port city, right? Yeah. Huge port city. So, because this is how, so Jesus didn't really grow his church when he was here. He didn't. No, he worked on, he worked on making disciples so they could go out. He worked, he worked on the guys, he built up the guys to witness him, to see he is the son of God, to prepare them to build the church after he's gone, right? But Jesus himself didn't, some people came to faith through seeing, being healed by him and through seeing what happened, like the centurion who saw him on the cross died when he, he's the son of God, okay, he came to faith. But the Gospels, they don't record making a big deal about Jesus. Followers, yes, but not like the church was growing. The church hadn't started yet. Yeah, there were followers of Christ. There were disciples. There was the beginnings, right? That wasn't the way it was supposed to work. But, they would have gone in and taken over right. the synagogue. Right. <clears throat> and and that that's and if you, and if you look at all your false religions, that's exactly how they work, right? So again, I'll repeat what I've said in every Bible class ever I've ever done. Until people are sick of hearing it, don't believe any religion that's founded on the word of one guy. And the Bible is not the word of one guy. I mean, it's the word of God through the minds and hands of 40-some guys. Uh, Book of Mormon? Uh-uh. One guy. Koran? Mm -mm. One guy. One guy in a cave. Book of Mormon? One guy who should have been in a cave with a rock in some place. Okay? Not to pick up. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses? Two guys. One after the other, but two guys. Uh, Scientology, one guy. Who's just having fun and wanted to get rich. Yeah, who said, hey, I'm not a great science fiction writer, but I think I could start my own religion, and he did. And actually, some of the science fiction is pretty good, too. Battlefield Earth. Battlefield Earth is magnificent. I've never got to that. Really, it's, it's, one of the, it's, one of the, it's long, it's ridiculous, it's, it's one of the greatest science fiction books ever written, in my opinion. The movie, dreadful. 
Do not watch. Uh, How do you explain that between people that follow Luther and people that follow Calvin? The Calvinists as opposed to Luther? I mean, I don't know, Calvin's a more charismatic guy? I don't know. I mean, when you read, I mean, I've read a lot of Calvin. Yeah, some of this stuff is not. And it's, some of it's good, but some of it's Some of it's persuasive. I mean, it's persuasive. He's a good writer. Um, It all boils down to literal interpretation. And it depends on what your definition of is is. And Luther said it before stupid Bill Clinton did. And that's what it all came down to, was when Jesus said, this is my body, what do you think is means? If you think is means it actually is his body, then it's talking about the real physical presence of his body and blood in the sacrament. And that is where they diverged. That's where it began. And then that splinter. And that's everything. I mean, everything you have in Protestantism today is the result of that split. Now you have some, like Church of England, you know, you have some where they actually may still believe it's the body and blood of Christ. Some of them, which they do, but some do. But that's where it all began. And that, that's where that division took place. Um, and that's when the, that all started from the Lutherans fighting among themselves, because it was just the universal church, the Roman Catholic church, and then, you know, Lutherans, and then the Lutherans, and then the Lutherans start fighting among themselves, because that's what people do. How do we get the Roman Catholic from the Jewish faith? How do we get the Roman Catholic from the Jewish faith? Yeah. What do you mean? Well, in Jesus' day, it was all he, he was there to preach to the Jews. So where did the where did the well, Roman Catholic come from? Well, he preached to Jew, he preached to Gentiles too. I know he did, but where did where did, I mean? I mean, how did it all? And you've got all these other right, right, right. Buddha and like, how did it get seated in Rome? Instead of Jerusalem, basically. Yeah. How did how did the Roman Catholic Church yes, yeah. actually get started? Yeah. yeah, and become like Constantine. the mother of all Constantine. I mean, Constantine's who made it legal. You know, once Christianity got big big enough, it was outlawed, and it was illegal to be a Christian. And then uh, the then the Rome was persecuting them, and then once Constantine converted uh, and made it legal. And by that time, it's already the seat of the empire is moving to the east by then. Yeah, it's already it's moving to Constantinople uh, because he established that city. But Rome is still the center of the empire. So it was a st- long established. Christianity was long established in Rome. Rome was the center of the universe for all practical purposes then. So you know, everything starts and ends in Rome. Jerusalem was just a backwater territory. There was nothing there. So it made sense that as the gospel spread, well, where are there going to be more Christians, Jerusalem or Rome? Rome's bigger. So it made sense that that would become a center for Christianity. So then the word Catholic means universal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the universal church, and that's what you will read in medieval manuscripts, and they'll talk about the universal church. So now we have to make a distinction once the Protestants came along. So we got to call, well, we'll call them the Roman Catholic Church, the word Catholic started been using, being used in study universal. So now we'll call them the Roman Catholic Church, Roman Universal Church, to, to make them distinct from these Protestants over and here. And then from, from there, that's where Luther broke off from the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, and before that, you had the Great Schism, which was in, I'm getting out of my area of history, but the Schism was in 11... I don't remember. So I just the, remember the that's East. the East. That's the East-West schism in the church. Yeah. All right. So that's when you had you, you had the Western Church, the Roman Catholic Church, and you have the Eastern Church, or the Eastern Catholic Church, which would be Orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy. That split before Lutheranism. Okay. Did it before? Yeah, before, way before. Oh yeah, it was eleven. Something. It was eleven something. Let me just look up Eastern schism. Yeah. So the big schism was in 11-something before the Protestant Reformation. The church had already divided. Well, so you had East and West. There was a Roman Catholic Church and Greek Catholic 
Church. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. The Eastern. 1053. 1053 is the Great Schism. That's when they broke from the Roman Catholic Church. Now you have the Eastern Orthodox Church. Okay, and how was their religion different from the Roman Catholics? Eastern Orthodoxy? Mm -hmm. uh, how much time do you have? It's, it's not that simple. Yeah. Uh, Worship-wise, if you forget the fact they're speaking, singing in a different language, or their liturgy, you would instantly recognize it and almost follow, like, kind of, you could follow what's going on. In fact, Divine Service Setting 1 is what the Eastern Orthodox Church uses. Okay. That's how old it is. That's how, how far back it goes. It's ancient. So, where, uh, but, where well, they where believe, did they, come from? The, the, the Roman? Well, Roman, yeah, okay. absolutely. That's what I absolutely. Uh, but yeah, there's a, still this Eastern Church folk around out here. What's Don't the Philoquy Clause in the Nicene Creed? Okay, Philoquy means and the Son. Okay, that's, Latin. that's, so besides they, the papal authority, it's that insertion of the Philoquy yeah, Clause. I, I'm, I'm getting that more. Oh, okay, but that's... Yeah, yeah so if you say the Creed in Eastern Orthodoxy, you will, if you say it in Latin, you will not get the, the word of Philoquy, which means and the Son. They believe that the Holy Spirit processes only from the Father. They're like, no, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, philoque, from the Son, and the Son. And they'll say, no, 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 no. And they'll point to Scripture and say, no, he proceeds from the Father. And we point to Scripture and go, no, from the Father and the Son. And they're wrong. <laughs> they're, they're wrong. Okay. Uh, so there's a Holy Spirit Trinity issue there. Um, but they don't have the Mary cult. They honor Mary as the Mother of God because she is... Theokotos, she's the mother of God. Uh, she rightly had, carries that title, but we don't worship her, we don't pray to her. Uh, neither do they. They honor her, and they honor many of the saints. Um, but they don't have that Mariology cult that Roman Catholicism has. Uh, and, and yes, it's they, a cult. Do they have the icons? Like oh, yeah, the they invented them. Okay. Yeah, they invented those things. So they, the icons, that's a distinct style of art. That's a big deal, very, very big deal. In, uh, in the Byzantine church and in, in like Russian Orthodox and Eastern. When you hear like Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, it's all Orthodox, all Eastern Orthodox, it's the same religion. <coughs> Just what language do they worship in? Uh, Russian Orthodox worships in Old Church Slavonic, which is an obscure <coughs> Baltic language that predates Russian. Um, and then, of course, in Greece, they sing it in Greek. And in different countries, in Romania, they sing in Romanian. They might do it in Slavonic, too. Uh, so wherever region, in, that's what language they worship in, but it's all Eastern Orthodoxy. There's not all these different Orthodox churches. Um, but that's where, where the idea or this concept of Roman Catholicism came from would be, okay, you had the Universal Church, then you had the Great Schism, now you have the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. And that's where the first distinction between two bodies came from. Uh, but yeah, so that, that's their big difference is uh, Trinitarian issues with the, with the uh, uh, Holy Spirit. Um, their Lord's Supper is different because I don't believe they kept the sacrifice of the Mass. They're actually more like we are on that. Um, but there's still there's still some saintly stuff going on. And like, for example, their monks believe uh, that one of the highest callings you can have is to be on a mountaintop in a monastery praying for the world. They actually believe they, their prayers help sustain the world. That, by, that, by, that the highest calling is that their prayers matter that much, that they have that much weight, that they are praying for the world. Uh, which any of us can do. But uh, that that is their vocation, that cutting themselves off from the world to do that is a high calling, which we would consider sinful. It's like, because you are, we're called to community, not to being that self. Like, okay, they might, yeah, and I mean, they have like Mount Athos, which is a fascinating place. So Mount Athos in Greece, here's a monastery. And as the monasteries go higher and higher up the mountain, Smaller, smaller, smaller. So you got like one dude in a cave, literally. And I'm not exaggerating. You can watch movies about this stuff because guys will go up there 
and they'll go hermit in a cave for like a month and they go nuts because that's so isolated that they go a little nutty and they have to like go back down the mountain. They don't last. Uh, so they think that's the highest calling is, that is just isolating, cutting themselves off from the world, dedicating themselves to the prayers of prayers for the world. And we would say, no, that is the most selfish thing you could possibly do. Because if you cut yourself off from society, you're of no use. And God intends us to be useful somehow in different vocations, but that ain't one of them. It's just cutting yourself off. So that's a difference. Uh, although their priests can be married, it's different. So it's different. Like I said, how much time do you have? There's, there's, it's more subtle and, and more varied than that. But that's the big issues, big things. Um, and I may have, may have misspoke about it because I haven't really studied it recently to really know what I'm talking about, other than the monk stuff, because I find them fascinating. Uh, and so is everybody throughout time. There's books from the Middle Ages about the holy men of Mount Athos uh, written in, is that one written in Middle English or is that one written in Latin? That one might be Latin. But there, there's, people have been fascinated by those guys forever because they just live up the mountain. Oh, and the women can't visit. <coughs> They're not even allowed to have female chickens. They can have eggs. They got to bring the eggs up, but you can't have female chickens. I think that, no, I take that back. I think they make an exception for the chickens because of the eggs for the painting of the icons because they use egg temper. So you can have female chickens, but that's it. No other women. So <laughs> it's weird, but that's where a lot of manuscripts were preserved. Uh, so we have to be thankful for, to them for preserving the Bible. Okay. I think that's all we wanted to talk about in Acts chapter 9 unless you had questions or whatever. I went a little afield, but again, you know, the, I think some of the important things to take out of this chapter, because we have these little just story after story, is to always remember, have an eye to how did that parallel Christ's life? How is this, how, is we, how are we seeing the apostles through their early church work mirroring what Jesus did which reinforces what they say about Jesus because they can do the things Jesus did. And it's just interesting to see the explosive growth of the church. And that's throughout all of Acts? The parallels go to... Oh, yeah. I think so. Okay. I think so. I mean, it's not going to culminate in Holy Week and then like an Easter. You know, you don't get that. But you're going to see just the life of the apostles, the life of Jesus. So, uh, yeah, you're going to see those parallels, I think, throughout the whole book. And I think they're intentional. And again, I think Luke did that deliberately. Uh, deliberately as a literary device. Because you, you can look at Luke and go, well, this stuff's not in the same order. Like he has Jesus preaching in, in uh, Nazareth right away. And then the other Gospels have him preaching in Nazareth later. Well, Luke doesn't say the first thing Jesus did was preach in Nazareth. It just said, as was his custom on the Sabbath, he went into the synagogue in Nazareth and said, well, and this happened. He didn't say it's the first thing he did. He said that's what he does on the Lord's Day. He's in the synagogue. It just happens to be, I'm going to start the story with what happened in Nazareth. Um, he did that deliberately for, um, for rhetorical effect because that's what great writers in the Greek language did. That's what that literature was like. That's what the patrons that are paying him to write this, helping him to get this gospel out and get this book out, uh, enjoy. And um, that's the best way to get it circulated is the kind of people who like that kind of literature because they're the ones that have the dinner parties where they read this stuff out loud. So, enough about that, a little review about that. Uh, that's where we will stop for this week. So next week, Luke chapter 10. No next week's No next week's Thanksgiving. So we can, after that, Luke chapter 10. Acts chapter 10.